Hello, everyone. We're giving um, our audience a few moments to enter uh, from the waiting room. So we'll begin the webinar shortly. Welcome everyone. This is our weekly uh, platform trial webinar update. This is Sabrina Paganoni and I'm speaking from the Healy Center with Dr. Mary Sukovic and our patient engagement team, Catherine Small and Alison Bulat. So thank you so much for, for joining. And as always, uh, we have a short slide deck, but please we are here mostly to answer your questions. So uh, type your questions in the Q&A uh, box and, and then we will definitely take them during the, 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 the webinar. Next slide. So for those of you who have been following us for a while, you know that we are very excited about the platform trial as a shared uh, infrastructure and, and really great collaborative effort to test as many drugs as possible for ALS. And we launched in 2020 and we are already at drug number seven. Uh, so we, we are actually enrolling for two drugs, number six and number seven, also known as regimens F and G. And it's really great that um, we really have, you know, we really have a large collaboration with many sites to uh, test multiple drugs. Uh, we are also working hard to complete uh, the fifth drug, uh, regimen E. Uh, we should have the results um, over the um, next few weeks. But uh, by the end of the year or so. Uh, but for now, uh, as always, we also want to give you updates about the enrolling regimens, regimens F and G. Uh, these are the regimens that are actively uh, enrolling new participants. And we know that we always have questions from, from people who join these webinars about where to join, how to join. So we want to provide you with all the information in case you're interested in, in joining and participating. Next slide. So, so far, uh, a little over 300 people have um, um, been starting the screening process for the regimens that are enrolling, regimens F and G, and over 200 have already been dosed uh, with either active or placebo for either F or G. So thank you so much. Really great progress. Um, you know, we're sort of kind of, you know, uh, you know moving along, and, and but we're still uh, obviously not fully enrolled. So we have lots of spots available. Uh, and those spots are available at multiple sites in the US. If you can go to the next slide, right now, uh, to be precise, we have 61 sites that are currently active. You can see them on the map, and you can also see their names to the right. But most importantly, if you use the link or QR code, you can be brought directly to our website where you can find the content information uh, so that you can reach out directly to the site near you. Next slide. And, and this is how uh, that the link would look like. So essentially, uh, you can check the status of your uh, sites online. If it says recruiting, it means that they are recruiting for F or G uh, or both. Uh, and, and really, there is the trial content information. So um, and we expect all sites to basically be enrolling for both. Uh, and we are still activating the last few sites. So hopefully, we'll be able to have uh, a few more sites active over the next few weeks. But again, we are really already present uh, at a very large number of sites across the country um, and we're adding more sites to add more capacity given the the interest in the study um, and and again uh, if you have any questions please feel free to contact your sites uh, or you can contact Catherine or Alison our patient engagement team next slide we have a number of resources on our website uh, more recently, we focused a lot on biomarkers because that's an important topic in ALS research. So if you're new to the field and you want um, to get like a primer to, to, to start learning about biomarkers, we have a new resource uh, on our website and you can follow again the QR codes or the links that you can see on the slide. Uh, this is a new brochure. We have many more brochures. So for those of you who are new, I see many new, new names uh, on the participant list today. If you're new and want to read about the trial, and, and about why we're doing this. We have a video, we have lots of resources on our website. And I know that Catherine Candley always puts links on in the chat. So thank you for doing that. Uh, again, we have a great short video to learn about what the trial is about. We have lots of brochures to learn about the drugs. And we have a number of recorded webinars um, in addition to the brochures where you can actually hear uh, directly from the scientists who develop the drugs that we've been testing. And you can uh, get more detailed information about 
about the mechanism of action of the drugs, including drugs F and G, which we are uh, enrolling for right now. Next slide. So this is another link to our pages. Uh, again, the biomarkers are an important topic, a very timely topic in the field because of some rapidly developing biomarkers. Obviously, uh, you may know that neurofilament levels were used uh, as a biomarker to accelerate the approval of the first one for people with SOD1 ALS. We're measuring neurofilament levels in all trial participants in our trial, but we also have additional biomarkers that are uh, sort of um, kind of hot off the press and really been developing now and and they are available in the um, to measure in the spinal fluid or CSF and that's why we are taking lumbar punctures as part of regimens F and G and and we have a number of um, resources on our website including webinars from scientists uh, who are really active uh, in in biomarker research to um, to really think about you know why uh, biomarkers are important and lots of um, webinars as well uh, it's about the lumbar puncture itself so we have a video uh, and brochures and webinars with experts in lumbar puncture if you, you know, that answered questions from the, from the audience and we will be sure to invite them back for new uh, live webinars as well. Next slide. And as always, if you have specific topics or requests or questions, please send them to our patient navigation team. Uh, you can find their phone number and email on the slide. Uh, we will continue to do these webinars and we have the ALS link, which is our uh, newsletter if you want to sign up for those. Uh, and we have a list of guest speakers for the upcoming webinars. We always try to mix up the content. Uh, and so we uh, we are very excited to, uh, to host some, uh, to have as guest speakers some of our uh, partners and collaborators, including some of the foundations that are supporting the trial. So very excited to have Jen DiMartino from ALS1, uh, a great foundation uh, that's supporting the trial. She'll be on next week. Uh, and then the following week, we will have Amanda Lee from the ALS Association. Uh, and then uh, we will spend a little bit more time focusing on expanded access uh, the last week of September, uh, because we've been receiving a number of questions about expanded access. So uh, again, lots of different topics. Uh, uh, for the um, for the new uh, webinars, and with that, I think we can stop sharing the slides. And I think uh, Dr. Sukovic will ask a few questions. Or yes, great. Yes, please yeah. put any of your questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, I'm going to read them to Sabrina today, and I'll, I may answer a few as well, and, uh, and also any for Allison and Catherine. So, first question is that the um, the process for enrolling in F and G is um, there's more, it's more involved than compared to regimen E. Um, in particular, um, some um, time you have to wait for the screening labs. Could you um, explain a little bit why, um, why, yes. why it's different? Yeah, so basically there is one more visit, uh, which is due to um, some more labs that need to be done for safety reasons. And so each regimen, so the, the regimens are, the different regimens have some similar processes and we really try to keep it streamlined uh, and we try to combine visits as much as possible. However, for some regimens, uh, some of them, including F and G, uh, we do need to analyze certain labs uh, and they need a couple of days or a few days to, to be returned. So unfortunately, there is an, an additional visit compared to Regimen E uh, to make sure that all of, of the data comes back. So unfortunately, we depend, you know, we have to depend on the lab as well. Um, so I, I would say that we're making great progress and we have, um, you know, again, the, the enrollment uh, is actually going well, uh, but yes, there is that extra step um, of, of waiting for the labs. Um, and then there's a question about um, one site in particular, but maybe I thought you could answer about that, but maybe in general about why some sites are, are activated and some are not. So this, this particular one uh, has to do with UC Irvine being not activated yet. Um, yeah. And first, first of all, I just want to say for both to this person and anyone else who may have questions about specific sites, please email Catherine because I know she's been in contact with, she's constantly in contact with all sites really and all coordinators and so she can help kind of inquire on your behalf. Uh, I will say, and perhaps that was part of the previous question as well, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest uh, from the patient community and, and we're still, we're now in this situation where, you know, it's, it's hard for sites to almost keep up with the demand and so that can lead to 
to delays or to the wait list issue or like, you know, not being able to execute on all regimens. I think this is due to the really the explosion in number of trials offered and number of spots offered per trial. I mean, uh, that's both good and bad. In a way, you know, in, in you know, just, just a few years ago, there was maybe only one trial going on at any given time. And so there wasn't as much time in that was needed to activate sites or to screen interested participants. Now we have more trials, more options, including expanded access. And so the capacity of the sites is basically distributed across different programs. So I think that explains why, um, depending on the specific situation, staffing, et cetera, uh, sites may take more or less time to activate or enroll participants. It depends a little bit on the site. Um, so there's a question about, there's two questions about clean. I think they're, the, the, they're both the same. I'm happy to answer it. You can answer yeah, it. please go ahead. Uh, it's, it's, there was a recent news uh, press release on clean. So, uh, um, and how can people be in the next study of clean? So clean was regimen C. That's clean nanomedicine is the name of the company. The drug is CNAU8. So they just announced results of the long-term follow-up of, of, of the study they did in Australia. So not the results from uh, the Healy platform trial, but they had done a phase two study in Australia, 45 people, nine months where um, some people got the drug, some placebo, and then after nine months, everybody got the drug. And this was their reporting of a long-term follow-up. And they, re they reported some positive results on longevity, um, uh, uh, comparing people who started the drug uh, nine months earlier to people who started it nine months later, and also to a natural history database um, from something we had created uh, uh, called ProAct. Um, so this is all, I think, positive news. Um, but I would say it's it's um, it's well, I would say exploratory just because it's forty five people, um, and it certainly supports their decision to go forward to phase three testing. Um, that trial, that phase three testing, uh, is, hasn't started yet. So I. I, uh, I I think as soon as that trial is open, there'll be a big announcement, I'm sure, about it if people are interested in it. Um, but as far as I know, they haven't started that yet. Um, and I, we have reported the results of the clean from the Healy platform trial, and uh, that's also out in the press release on our website, which, which we did see some positive results, and we're working on uh, the paper to get all the data out of that as well. Um, so there's a question. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so there's somebody who's in regimen F, and thank you for that. They had the initial lumbar puncture, and then they uh, you the participant actually offered to do an extra one in the middle, uh, but the the scientists uh, there said that that wasn't needed. That um, that having the one at the end at week 24 was sufficient, and they're saying I'm not I'm not anxious to have another one, but I'd love to advance the science. Can you uh, clarify? No, this is a great question. And first of all, thank you so much for being part of the study and also for volunteering uh, for the lumbar puncture. You know, I, I agree with you that obviously the, the, this procedure is so important and I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, inspired that you, you are you're willing to do even extra compared to the protocol. And, and, and that's for good reasons because the biomarkers are very important. Now, we, when we designed the study, we work closely with the scientists to balance sort of, you know, uh, the time and effort um, that, you know, uh, lumbar punctures would, um, would, would, would require and the return on investment. And it was felt in collaboration with the scientists that doing the lumbar puncture basically twice at the beginning and at the end of the study would, would be the best balance so that it's not too burdensome. You know, it's, you know, only two times and we still get enough data. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, I think that we're doing it again uh, at the beginning of the end as you're doing uh, is incredibly helpful. Um, so there's a, um, there's a, a, someone who's, um, would like to be in the Healy Center and they spoke to their team at the ALS clinic and they agreed to participate, but then they were told that there was a wait list at that site mm. and they want to know what to do. So, so, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I, I would say that, you know, as, um, it goes back to the issue of trial capacity and, um, at, at the sites. And so, because, you know, um, we have many spots, in fact, for the, for the platform trial and, and it's hard for, let's say, a single team to follow many people. We are working hard with, with groups and foundations to really find ways to increase capacity at the sites. And, and that's why we're also opening new sites to increase capacity in 
areas that uh, where, where more people live. So um, I would say, you know, uh, if there's a specific concern to also email Catherine and see if she can help, you know, connect you more directly with the site. Uh, we're really doing everything we can to make sure that everyone who wants to participate can participate. On occasion, there's a couple of sites in any given city. So for example, in Boston, uh, there's a couple of sites and there's also uh, UMass not too far. So, um, you know, on occasion, we're able to help people, um, you know, find a spot maybe at a site that's very near. Um, that could be another option. Uh, I don't know exactly where you are located and if, if there's, there's two sites maybe that, that can accommodate you there. The question of whether Regimen F and G are offering EAPs. So not at this time. Um, so I uh, we uh, definitely are making lots of progress on in on EAPs in general, uh, and obviously you know we 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 run other EAPs. We always ask our industry partners about EAPs for any new regimen, um, and and I believe that the scientists from for both F and G uh, took this question as part of previous webinars, and they'll be back uh, to again take this more. Uh, I feel like you know the co companies are now realizing the importance of EAPs, and so they're planning for things like this and so I'm, I'm sure that uh, that's you know that, that's being considered and hopefully that will be offered soon but um, you know at times companies want to wait to have enough data or, or enough data from the study before launching an EAP in addition to that. Yeah I'll just add that both Calico and Denali they had phase one trials in um, in ALS and small number of people but this is really their first study where they're um, giving the drug to more people and so they don't have a lot of uh, long-term safety data in people yet. So it's not unreasonable to wait um, you know, until it's first interim analysis or the second before starting the, uh, an, uh, the EAP program. But we're, we, uh, we, we have it on our radar and our EAP patient advisory committee is also working with us on that. Um, there's a question about neuron grafting and whether that's done in any clinical trials and if not, any idea about this? Yeah, so I, I, I guess there are if I understand the, 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 the exact question, it's more uh, transplanting neurons into, for example, the spine or the brain, grafting it in an area that's affected. So, uh, well, let's start by saying that obviously you know, there's different techniques, um, you know, and, and some have been tried in different neurological diseases. Uh, the, the issue when, when you take nerve cells and you put them in a, in a, in a new location, it's not just putting the cell there, it's also the connections that the cell, the nerve cell needs to make within the host so that by connecting it, it can actually function properly and be integrated into the neuronal network that, that basically is hosting or receiving the graft. So I think that's the problem that it's hard, you know, it's not um, always, you know, immediate or, uh, you know, the, it, again, the, the results, it, you know, even if it sounds like a good idea, I mean, obviously it depends on um, the specifics. And I think that, you know, research is ongoing, but it's not as easy as it might sound to just replace the neurons. I would say there's some other techniques such as, you know, providing uh, more um, less specialized uh, cells like stem cells, you know, the, the idea is not so much that they will turn into neurons and then graft themselves or connect themselves to the remaining neurons, but it's more that they can provide support nutrients, growth factors to support the neurons that are already there. So um, it's it's hard to replace the neurons themselves and, and, and think that the new, new cells will just integrate uh, in terms of the connections. But I'm not saying that that's not possible. Hopefully with new technology that will also be possible in the future. Um, I have a family member uh, of, of a patient trying to choose a trial. She's trying to decide between two. How can we help her choose? Now that's, that's a great question. It's also a hard question. I can tell you what I talked to my patients about and, and then um, obviously um, Dr. Sukovic, if you want to add more. Uh, but it, it, so in my mind, really that as a, person also designing clinical trials, the, the ethics of clinical trials is that you truly don't know if the drug works or not. So that we don't know that, you know, any of the drugs in clinical trials work. However, we put them in trials when there is reasonable science, there is a good preclinical rationale, previous experiments uh, and good data and reasons to put it in a trial. So when you have to choose between two trials, really, as long as the 
both trials are, you know, um, with good solid science behind them, uh, it's really very hard to, to tell in advance, uh, you know, which one will work. I think that it's important to make sure that, uh, you know, both trials, again, have solid science, they are conducted, uh, you know, big centers or, or centers that are connected to uh, big academic networks where, you know, we know that the design and the science and all the processes are, you know, well, um, sort of well established. Uh, and then really talking with your physician to think about, you know, based on the specific condition of that specific person, which trial makes the most sense. There are trials that may require more visits, visits than others or, or more intense procedures than others. And so also thinking about what makes, practically speaking, the most sense, you know, how many visits, et cetera. So it's a combination of both science and practicalities and availability at the site. As always, I think, you know, uh, talking with the physician is important. Uh, somebody who can really guide you through this process because, you know, um, I will say that also online you can find sort of, you know, all sorts of centers offering alternative treatments or other things that are not exactly, you know, scientifically sound. So I think that talking to people who are really, you know, um, connected to centers of excellence or, or big clinics is, is important. Yeah, I couldn't think. I say it better. I agree. Um, the, it's a good problem to have. We used to not have that many trials. Now there's a lot of them. And so it takes yeah. time to figure out what's right for you and to get um, input from different people. Um, I'll, I'll add that besides Catherine and Allison, uh, there's also um, uh, a nurse that works with us, Judy Carey, who, who speaks to people interested in clinical trials and goes through all the different, um, you know, the science as well as the, the visits and can help people if that's of interest. So we did get some questions before around um, some stem cells, and I wanted to um, ask those questions. I have to find them. So one was um, that I, uh, someone was told that if they had received stem cells before, um, that they were not eligible for the platform trial. And I want to say that that's actually not accurate. Um, we have uh, said if somebody got, let's say somebody was in the brainstorm trial before and they want to be in this one, they can, um, as long as they're not it's still on, on the on a trial, as long as 30 days has passed, they can be on it. If someone's received stem cells where the stem cells are in the brain or in the spinal cord and they're still there, then that would be exclusionary. But those trials don't actually exist anymore. Those were for a long time ago. So I don't think that's part of the question. Um, so hopefully that's clear. If um, uh, if the person who asked it wants to reach out to Catherine Small, we can obviously um, talk to the site and maybe um, just tell them, I kind of clarify that, but um, it's not exclusionary. Then the other question was, what happens if neuro is approved? Um, can that person be in the HEAT platform trial? So we, we would treat that the same way we treated um, other approvals, uh, oral Aderavone and Deliverio. And this is how all trials do that, is that um, we, we do ask people who are in the double blind part of the trial, um, which is the six month period, to try not to start those new medications during the six months. Um, and the reason for that is because then it makes it next impossible to tell if the new drug is working or not. And um, it can, um, and we do we know we need new, new drugs that um, even neuron and these other ones, they don't, they're not the cures of the of the illness, so we need to still develop new ones. So, so we do ask for that. But once the open label part of the study comes, which is after being in the study for six months, when everyone can get the active drug we're testing, then people can take um, you know new drugs that are coming. So that that's how we handled it for oral Aderivone and Relivrio. And I'd say we spent a lot of time talking to people about this to explain why. And uh, I'd say you know ninety five percent of people in the study. We're, we're okay with doing that. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll deal with that when, it, you know, once we know the results of the FDA review, uh, we'll uh, obviously have a lot of webinars to discuss it, but thanks for asking it. It's a, again, a good problem for the field to have that we're getting all these new drugs out and we have to think about how we can still do trials and get meaningful results while um, getting new drugs on the market. I don't know, Sabrina, if you wanted to add. Anything. No, no, absolutely. I completely agree. So there's a related question where someone was told that they would receive the real drug at the end of study there on regimen F. Is that true? Maybe That's you... true. Yes, exactly. So uh, in, in our trial for all the regimens, 
at the end of the six month placebo control trial where the participant doesn't know if uh, he or she is getting active drug or placebo, there is a, a longer term uh, active treatment extension where the participant is assured to receive active drug after completing the placebo control period of the study, which is six months. In fact, that could be a factor um, in deciding which trial to, to, um, to join. If, if it's important to you to receive active drug at the end of the trial, you know, trials that uh, include an active treatment extension may be perhaps of more interest. Uh, and and we, we understand why that's important to the community. So yes, uh, there would be active treatment extension for all of our regimens. Related question, which I think is more of a reminder to us as we were talking about how people choose what trial to be in, is to also look at the, um, the placebo, active to placebo ratio um, and also whether there's an open label extension. And I know, Sabrina, if you want to just remind what the, what the um, active to placebo ratio is. Yeah. So for the platform trial, it's three to one, which is favorable, which means that for every four people who enter the trial, three go on active drug and only one goes on placebo. Now, historically, this was not possible because each trial was done on its own. And when you do a trial kind of in isolation, normally uh, the ratio is one to one. So 50% chance of getting active or placebo or at most two to one. So for you know two people who get active and one placebo. The reason we could uh, improve on the active to placebo ratio and bring it to three to one is because we are working in the context of a platform trial where we're following the same protocol and use the same infrastructure to test multiple drugs so that the placebo group can sh be shared and essentially we can maximize the learnings for the few people who are on placebo. There's a question, and I know we're almost out of time. I think we can do this one. Does Amelix have anything new to share now that Relivrio has been approved for almost a year now? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, what I can say is that obviously the drug uh, is being in use and, you know, uh, many more people are receiving it. Uh, and um, I know that, you know, Amelix is working on many more exciting projects. There is obviously the phase three trial that's ongoing that will read out next uh, next year. Uh, that's a larger, longer trial. Uh, hopefully, you know, that will allow also the, the European approval to happen. Uh, and then obviously uh, new drugs, new new biomarkers, new, new projects uh, for the companies. So I think it's great to have a new company that's dedicated to ALS. Thank you. I think we got through all the questions. It's great to see everybody and also see new people here. Please keep um, if you if you like coming here, please spread the word to other people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye.